Okay, we're here right now with Daniel Woodrow, who's the author, most recently, of The Maid's Version. I'm holding it in my hand. It's a small, beautiful book. Uh, welcome, first of all. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, any of your readers, of your recent books especially, will know the town of West Table, Missouri. It's become part of your world and mm -hmm. the relations and the people who know one another and the cousins and the uh, uh, other relations. This one takes us back in time to 1929. Can you talk a little bit about the idea of going back to West Table in an earlier time? Well, uh, I, may, I mean, I made up my town of West Table, but it's, as people who live where I live can tell you, pretty close to <laughs> Uh, where I actually live and my family's been from around there for several generations so I know a lot of stories that go back to the beginning of the town more or less and one of the big events that happened in our town was in 1928 there was a dance hall explosion that wiped out a lot of what were considered to be the most promising young people of town all at once and uh, it's never satisfactorily explained what happened or solved and tons of rumors running around and Still to this day, they just had a memorial in April for them again. Uh, and uh, my grandmother was a maid for a family. Uh, who, one of the uh, male members of that family is, if it was not some kind of weird colossal accident, if it was perpetrated on purpose, he's one of the first names that comes up. And uh, she passed her suspicions along and uh, eventually turned it into fiction and quit doing research and let my imagination fill in the the blank spaces and uh, had a lot of fun and it allowed me to paint a broader picture of the culture of the town than some of the other books have. You didn't always write about the Ozarks, so your, all of your recent books have been about the Ozarks in some way, shape or form, though they re-released re some of your original books, which has been great for people who might have missed them. Um, you didn't start with the Ozarks, for no. instance. What, what made the switch, first of all, and maybe you could also talk about your decision at the beginning not to write about them at all, something you knew so I, well. I th did not think I would ever want to write about the Ozarks. I really didn't because uh, as a younger man, I thought it was too slow, too, too country, too a lot of things that when you're 25, you might not appreciate as much as I did as I got older. I wanted city life. I wanted, you know, late nights and things. We don't really have that. Um, and I'd also uh, spent a lot of time growing up along the Missouri and Mississippi River valleys, and uh, the lore of the river had always interested me. And when I was younger, I either would gravitate west or to New Orleans, one, one direction or another. So that always seeped into me deeply, and I began to think about it and write about it. And I, I really uh, loved Chandler, Hammett, and all the rest of them, uh, John D. McDonald, the Crumley, all the... Uh, so those first books, I really was just looking for a milieu to set it in where a lot of things would happen. So. It's a, there's a lot of similarities in the type of people that come in both books. Obviously, yeah. the Bayou, New Orleans brings up some similarities to the Ozarks. Yeah. But when you switched back, what was it that made you say, actually, I'm, I'm interested in this, this part of the world? Well, I had returned to the Ozarks to live for a couple of years and then decided, oh, I got to get out of here. And we moved to California. Uh, and I thought I was gonna write a book set in California. And very quickly, the Ozarks started coming into me. Uh, I found myself writing things down about the Ozarks and I ended up writing, uh, throwing the California book away and writing a book about the Ozarks. And that's when I realized that my attachment to it went a lot deeper than I was given credit for. And you know, I've kind of been in it since then. So. Your, your books sort of show the, uh, the, the often dark underbelly of this beautiful region. Um, and I'm sure the Ozark Tourism Association, this is not the <laughs> area of, that they would like to be highlighted in many cases. Right. Um, what is your relationship like with people from Missouri and the Ozarks itself who are justifiably proud of their area, but recognize that the truth in some of your novels? Yeah, uh, it's been actually very, very good. I, kept, I keep waiting for uh, negative things to come up when I do signings or readings or something in the region but over and over like when Winter's Bone came out people lined up and almost every one of them said I know a family just like that or somebody down the hills just like that or whatever they I didn't have anybody get in my face and say you need to stop doing this until I went on tour and people in California and stuff started telling <laughs> But uh, no, none of the local people were saying that to me. That's funny. Because 
one of the things about living in that region is uh, it's not economically segregated. We all, you know, the wealthy and the not wealthy live within 100 yards of each other. We see each other all the time. Everybody's, nobody's hidden from view. So we're aware of the various kinds of lives being led there and, and nobody's blind to that. So. So you also have written short stories, and, and in fact, a lot of your books are pretty quick reads. You know, for people who are reading them, you, you're you are a novella kind of person. You know, what are your thoughts about the op options today for writers to write shorter than three or four hundred pages and to write a hundred and fifty page novella or book? Yeah, I really like compressed prose and and tight storytelling. As a rule, there are always some books that break that rule. I love like Jim Harrison's novellas and other guys who do pure novellas, 80 or 90 pages. I, I really enjoy reading them. Uh, I, I don't know how publishers feel about it, but uh, I, I really love the tight, short-length novel uh, uh, under 200 pages, maybe 100 and, between 150 and 250. I really like that length. Many, I realize many of my favorite books end up being about that length, so it's just a, I, I've talked to a number of other writers, Ron Rash and others, who. Uh, have told we've had this conversation. I just like tight, short, quick hitting things. So. Well, all your books dive right in. I mean, you don't waste a lot of time getting right to the story. And those first few sentences or paragraphs are usually really important to the story. Yeah. And I, I love. I think your readers have grown to love that. I certainly like it. The short story is an art form itself. It's a different discipline. What do you like about that? Even shorter than a novella. Even shorter than 150. That that 30 page story. I like, uh, again, the compression and how uh, one key moment can turn the whole thing. And uh, many, uh, quite a few of the short stories I wrote are, are under 10 pages. So uh, I do like that. Uh, I recognize that uh, uh, some of them, uh, the, when I do a story that ends up being 20 pages or something, I realize it took me a lot longer to get the right 20 pages than I thought it was going to take. And, uh, some of the short stories more or less erupted out almost whole, and others I worked on for two or three months to get 17 pages that I liked. So it's uh, it, it would be a hard way to make a living, I suspect. But. Are you working on them all the time, or are you usually working on a novel? I keep, I keep a notebook, and if uh, I, I've been at this enough now, I can sort of sense if something's right or not. And uh, I mean, I'm not always on the money, but. Uh, a lot of times I know it, this thing hasn't germinated enough, but I will open my notebook and add something else I've thought that might fit, and then eventually I'll realize it's kind of now or never. These things do have a season when they need to be written, too. That's the, for my, in my experience, and you need to do it then, or, and same thing with novels. You need to do it when it's ready. So. Uh, it's fun to see people get to know Daniel Woodrow a little bit. Um, and to be able to dip back. And in fact, you've gone back and taken some of your original books. The Bayou Trilogy recently was repackaged. Um, what are your thoughts about some of those works coming back out? You wrote them a long time ago. You've also progressed as a writer. What are your thoughts about seeing your older works back in print? Well, when I wrote those, that's the music I was into. I was really uh, enjoying that. My wife reread them when they were getting ready to be reissued. She said, don't worry about it, because I was asking her. I said, I don't even remember what I said for sure in 1986. But um, I subsequently have pulled them down and thumbed through them, and I feel pretty good about them. And there, uh, a lot of people ask me why I don't go back to doing book four of those and so forth. So I guess people are finding them and reading them and enjoying them. So there, there's always talk when anybody read a Daniel Woodrow book up to Winter's Bone that you are criminally underrated or unknown or everybody you know this person is just one of those people you should know but don't. Then came Winter's Bone. And with it, a lot of attention, probably some sales. Uh, what is your pre-Winter's Bone life like, life like compared to like your post-Winter's Bone? When your expectations, the, your promotion, etc. Well, part of it is, as uh, you mentioned earlier, I, I haven't historically toured a lot. And I live in the Ozarks, pretty far off the beaten path. There's no writer world down there or anything. So I really, after Winter's Bone, the book before the movie came out, I was aware that things seemed to be going better, but uh, not not really convinced of it, you know? So I didn't really start noticing the uh, difference in my circumstance until the movie came out and, uh, and then began to do well. 
you got to watch that being made, and you had the luxury, I think, of having a director, Deborah Granick, who's who's pretty true to the book, and a lot of, you know, and, and really understood the sort of dark, gritty elements of it, and an actress who was able to capture that. Yeah. Uh, was it hard for you to, to let it go originally, or, or did you feel like you were in good hands from the beginning? Um, they sent me her first film, which uh, had not done very much business or anything, but they sent me a disc of it, and I watched it, and I said, at each point she made the right artistic decision for my taste. Yeah. And so uh, I said I would be willing to, there were other people asking about it, but I said, I, I think she'll do it right, and it turned out to be the case. And she did, the books, completely present in there. There are a few modest changes, but she did not throw the book out and just keep the character or something. She she was really pretty true to it. Yeah, there's a scene in that movie where they're in the boat and they're rowing uh, and it's dark and Reed Dolly is being taken out, which is something I won't tell yeah. the people watching, that I felt like I was reading the book again. It was so exactly yeah. what was in my mind when I was reading the book that I thought, this woman has knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Meaning both the actress and the director and uh, the the the, for, the good fortune of uh, getting Jennifer Lawrence you know I, I don't even know exactly how that happened but I yeah. knew there were a lot of names mentioned along the road but yeah. uh, eventually it ended up with the right name so you know in your books there's always a, oftentimes there's a quote or, or something that sort of sets the tone where do these come from and, and, and are they sitting in the back of your brain all the time or are you looking for something that fits later um, they usually come up pretty early in the construction of the book, and they're almost like a tuning fork or something for me. When I, uh, uh, sounds kind of mystical and it's probably difficult to explain, but I sort of, it puts me in the right uh, tone, I think, and uh, that's why they're important to me. I, I do keep my eye out for such things and write them down when I see them, and uh, then I will realize that that sort of focuses me in the right way. I like that, pretty amazing. The book is the maid's version uh, I wish you a ton of luck. I hope that more and more people continue to discover all of your wonderful writing and that you continue to bring us books like this one. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Enjoyed it.